We are in a situation where both Russia and China are changing their forces. And if we don't like what they're doing, whether that's Russia with this bizarre science fiction weapons or China digging 120 silos, we're going to have to talk to them. That's the voice of Dr. Jeffrey Lewis, director of the East Asian Nonproliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at Middlebury Institute of International Studies. He, along with Decker Eveleth, former nonproliferation fellow at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies, are today's guests on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. That voice you just heard introducing our main interview was Derek Zender, our podcast audio engineer and producer who makes every episode run. This is his last week here at Plowshares Fun, and we are sorely going to miss him. Yes, Michelle, uh, we are going to miss Derek greatly. Uh, all the great content that you hear on the show sounds better because Derek was part of it. Uh, he was a great part of the show from every aspect of it. And, you know, all the things that happen behind the scenes that people don't appreciate, that's exactly what Derek was doing. So we all extend him a great uh, gratitude for all his effort on the podcast, and we wish him the best in his next adventure. And now on to today's show. Tom, what do you have lined up for us on Early Warning? Today, we are discussing a potential bright spot and an otherwise bleak budget horizon for new nuclear weapons in Congress. The House has taken a major step towards canceling a new nuclear weapon proposed by the Trump administration, and we will tell you all about it. After that, I sit down with Dr. Jeffrey Lewis, the director of the East Asia Nonproliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies and the co-host of the Arms Control Wonk podcast, and Decker Eveleth, a current student at Reed College, about their discovery of 120 missile silos currently under construction in China. We talk about what it means for Chinese nuclear forces and how the United States should respond. This has been a huge story the past two weeks with lots of speculation. So you won't want to miss hearing from the people who brought it to the public's attention. And if you like what you hear, as always, please remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Every little bit helps to grow our show and our audience, and we really do appreciate it. But with that, let's get to today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dell. As podcast listeners know, the Biden administration's first budget to Congress was a huge disappointment to our community as it seeks full funding for rebuilding the nuclear arsenal, including dangerous new weapons proposed by the Trump administration. Uh, given the politics in Congress, few Democrats want to oppose new nuclear weapons if those weapons have the support of President Biden. This has been a major setback to our efforts to stop the new land-based ballistic missile, a $264 billion program that we simply do not need. But there is one potential bright spot on an otherwise bleak budget horizon. A key committee in the House voted to eliminate funding for a new nuclear weapon that was proposed by President Trump and unfortunately supported by President Biden, the sea-launched cruise missile, a weapon that the Navy does not want. Here to tell us more about this is Monica Montgomery. She is Advocacy Coordinator at the Council for a Livable World. Monica, great to have you here. Thanks, Tom. Great to be here. Monica, please give us some context on the Sea Launch Cruise Missile and why your organization is opposing it. Absolutely. So before we dive into where we are now, I'm going to go a little bit of history here. So Sea Launch Cruise Missiles, which are typically deployed on attack submarines or surface vessels in the Navy and armed with lower yield nuclear warheads, used to be in the U.S. arsenal. It was in 1991 by President George H.W. Bush uh, that the fleet of attacks Slickums as we call them sea launch cruise missiles, uh, were actually removed from patrol and placed into storage until the Obama administration in its 2010 nuclear posture review deemed them redundant capability and officially retired them from the arsenal. 
In the 2018 nuclear posture review carried out by the Trump administration, however, uh, they decided that we needed to revive this capability and build a new generation of sea launch cruise missiles in order to counter the Russian non-strategic or lower yield nuclear arsenal, bring them to the negotiation table and deter a more aggressive China in the Indo-Pacific. On the campaign trail, President Biden actually opposed this weapon, calling it a bad idea and telling the Council for a Livable World in our presidential survey that the United States does not need nuclear weapons. The 2020 Democratic platform also opposed these weapons, calling the Trump administration's proposal to build new nuclear weapons as unnecessary, wasteful, and indefensible. Unfortunately, however, as you said, the Biden administration did put forth initial funding for this weapon, $15.2 million in its first budget request to Congress to begin a new program of record on the Sea Launch Cruise Missile and its associated warhead, the W80-4 alteration. This weapon and why we're posing it um, is pretty obvious. It's not needed for deterrence. We already have a number of low yield nuclear options with our B-61-12 gravity bombs, our air launch cruise missile, and the new low yield W-76-2 submarine launch ballistic missile that the Trump administration put into the arsenal. More than that, however, this weapon actually does not improve our deterrence and actually erodes our conventional deterrent. Most concerning, however, Putting nuclear cruise missiles back on attack submarines will blur the line between our conventional arsenal and our nuclear arsenal. Nuclear and conventional cruise missiles carry essentially the same radar profile in their launch. In fact, since 1991, the U.S. has launched over 2,000 conventional cruise missiles. So when an adversary sees a cruise missile being launched from an attack submarine, if there's nuclear weapons on those boats, there's no way for them to know whether that's a conventional or a nuclear missile um, being fired. And that blurs the line between the two weapons and increases the possibility of nuclear escalation. This concern is what actually led Acting Navy Secretary Thomas Harker to issue a memo earlier this summer in June telling the service to plan to defund the Slickham Inn in next year's budget. While this was met with much fear on Capitol Hill um, by many hawks saying that uh, the Acting Navy Secretary was going out of his lane to do so, it really actually confirmed what many of us had largely suspected, that the Navy does not want this weapon. Great. Thanks for that. And so uh, with all that information, what has Congress done so far? Absolutely. So the opposition in Congress to the Slickham actually started before the budget even came out. Uh, Representative Joe Courtney of Connecticut and Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland introduced a bill earlier this year, the Nuclear Slickham Ban Act, to prohibit funding for research, development, production, or deployment of these missiles. The bill, each bill in each chamber has around a dozen co-sponsors and has been a really great tool for activists uh, to educate members of Congress on why this weapon is unnecessary and destabilizing. All this work led up to a very exciting development uh, at the end of uh, June when the House Appropriations Defense Subcommittee, so the first committee to mark up its yearly appropriations bill, actually eliminated funding for the Navy portion of the Slickham. So in this year's budget request, $5.2 million is allotted for the Navy to begin work on the cruise missile, while $10 million is allotted for the National Nuclear Security Administration, the NNSA, to begin work on the warhead. The, the subcommittee that has oversight of the warhead, the House Energy and Water Development Subcommittee, will actually be considering their bill this week. So we'll be following closely to see if they uh, track what the Defense Subcommittee did in eliminating funding. And we're very hopeful uh, that we could see progress on this front to block uh, spending through the House Appropriations Committee. The House and Senate Armed Services Committees also have oversight of the weapon through their yearly authorizing process, the National Defense Authorization Act. And both of them are slated to take up their bills later this month, um, the end of July. We know that in the House, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Adam Smith, along with many other Democrats in the committee, opposed this weapon. Across the aisle, his colleagues, Representative Rogers and Representative Turner, are staunch advocates of it. So it's certainly going to be a battle in that committee, but we're hopeful that the House could come out strong blocking funding for this weapon, despite the Biden administration's proposal to fund it. And as things move into the Senate, what do you expect to happen there? Absolutely. So as we know, Senate politics are a lot more complicated and a lot more challenging, especially because it's a closer line, despite the fact that the House Democrat versus Republican line is also very narrow. At this moment, we still don't know when the Senate Appropriations Committee is going to take up these bills, 
but we're hopeful that that committee could be a really great place to block funding as well. We have a lot of champions on that committee, um, including Senator Van Hollen, Senator Merkley, Murphy, Schatz, Baldwin, who have all come out in opposition to this program. So not saying that's going to be easy. There's obviously a lot more higher priorities um, for these members of Congress, but I think that there will be strong support or we're hopeful that we can continue our Washington-based advocacy and our across-the-country grassroots campaign to push these members to oppose this weapon in fiscal year 2022. And the reality of flat budgets and an emphasis on upgrading the Navy's conventional fleet makes a powerful case against the Slick Men, which is expected to cost at least $10 billion over the next decade, not even accounting for the costs that it will require to recertify these attack submarines. Even if Congress acts or if Congress doesn't act, we still have an opportunity, and that's in the upcoming nuclear posture review. Just last week, we learned that the Biden administration has begun its nuclear posture review, which will run the course of about six months, supposedly, and review the entire nuclear arsenal. While the Biden administration did move forward on funding for this program and its first request, there are really good signs, as, as stated by the president's former uh, opposition to the program, that they could cancel this program in the review. So in addition to our work with Congress, we'll continue the effort um, to engage the administration um, to get constituents across the country to be calling on the president to not move forward on this plan um, to build these weapons and the nuclear posture of you. Great. Uh, Monica, our time is up, but thank you so much for being here. And I really wish you all the best as this work goes forward. Thanks, Tom. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Warner, and I'm the managing director of Plowshares Fund. Even though I've been working in the nuclear field for nearly nine years, there is still so much to learn. That's why I'm a dedicated listener of Press the Button. I so appreciate each episode where I can get the top stories of the week and a deeper dive into critical conversations with thought leaders and experts in nuclear policy and national security. I'm also a proud supporter of Plowshares Fund. Did you know that many of the guests featured on Press the Button are supported by Plowshares? Since our founding 40 years ago, all of our work is made possible by individuals just like you. Curious, committed, passionate. If you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Whether it's $5, $50, $500, your generosity helps create a safer future free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Visit plowshares.org today to make a donation or join me and make it monthly. Whatever you do, stay informed, stay safe, and stay connected. Together, we can create a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. Dr. Jeffrey Lewis is the director of the East Asia Nonproliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies, a professor at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies and co-host of the legendary podcast, Arms Control Wonk. He has held leadership positions with the New America Foundation and the Managing the Atom Project at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, among others. His fictional 2018 book, and I stress fictional, the 2020 Commission Report on the North Korean Nuclear Attack against the United States was a chillingly timely read. The Economist summed it up well, writing, the terrifying thing about the 2020 commission report is how much of it is real. Decker Eveleth is an undergraduate student at Reed College. He is a former nonproliferation fellow at the James Martin Center and an incoming student to the Monterey Institute. Welcome to the show. Greetings. Hello. Last week, your discovery was profiled in the Washington Post. Satellite images taken by Planet and analyzed by the CNS team show that China appears to be significantly expanding the number of silos for its arsenal of intercontinental range ballistic missiles. Specifically, Decker, you identified 120 silos under construction, building on your previous work with Jeffrey and David Laboon. First off, this is huge, huge news. Congratulations on all of your hard work. Thank you. It, it was um, difficult to find um, and took a lot of time, but I'm glad that we uh, we got there and uh, it's uh, information that's out there. Now, 120 sounds like a lot of silos, given that the Federation of American Scientists estimates that China only has around 350 warheads. What does this mean for Chinese nuclear forces? 
So it's been pretty surprising to see this um, change now because previously what we've seen is that China's rocket force has been investing heavily in mobile forces. So um, they're investing in missiles that you can put on vehicles and move around and make sure they're more survivable. And so the discovery of 120 new silos is not only unprecedented because usually they have they build you know uh, six at a time in previous years, but it's also very unusual for where people expected the PLA to take their strategy and take their force posture. Yeah, if I could just follow up on that, uh, you know, there are kind of two ways of looking at it. On the one hand. Um, you know, the U.S. has 400 ICBMs out of a force of, you know, nearly 2,000 weapons on alert. And so, uh, 100 isn't that many. On the other hand, China had 100 ICBMs that could target the United States. So, 120 would double that. And so, it's it's a really interesting change because it's it's a real change in, in pattern for them. And so, when you see something changing so rapidly and dramatically, it really makes you want to look at the situation and ask like, well, like what's going on here? That's exactly what I would like to know. Why do you think that they are building these? So we looked at the silos. My um, sort of analysis of the situation is the fact that China has been concerned about the numerical superiority of the American arsenal. And one of the things you see you hear from time, time from um, some scholars in the mainland is that um, they'll talk about and they'll do these elaborate analyses of how the United States might use a large number of nuclear weapons to catch a small number of mobile forces by saturating the area, basically. And that people have done these analysis studies from time to time. Um, and so building a set of 120 silos means that the United States has to dedicate around 240 of our warheads to destroy those targets. And so you are taking pressure off of your mobile forces by making it so that the United States would have to dedicate a large portion of their available resources destroying a fixed target. Yeah. And, you know, as for me, it's it's such an interesting change because when I got into the business, China was still transitioning from its liquid propellant ICBMs to solid propellant ICBMs. So I am like so old that I remember when people were getting worked up that China was going from like seven ICBMs to 18. Like that was like a, that was like a big deal. Uh, and you know, my, my own observation about it is that for a long time, we've been, we've been living on borrowed time in, in the sense that the U S has been spending so much on our own modernization and the development of defenses. And we've seen the Chinese and the Russians sort of complain about it for like 20 years, but they never really did anything. And it's just only in the last few years, I think that we have seen real changes in China and Russia's forces. And, and you know, they're changing in different ways. And it's not entirely about the US. It's also about like changes in those countries. But it is so striking to me because, you know, we're going from this kind of post-Cold War period where numbers were going down and things were relaxed to like what I would characterize as kind of the beginning of an arms race where our our deployments are predicated on theirs and vice versa. And they're worried about survivability. And, you know, maybe it's not the same intensity as it was during the Cold War, but it's it worries me. Now, just to clarify, when you talk about 120 silos, do you think each of those are going to be filled with a missile? Oh, this is the this is the big question. I think Decker and I talk about this all the time. Um, and I, I think Decker, we both agree we don't know. Yeah, we would need to see more. I mean, if they've done it competently, it would be very difficult for us to figure it out. Um, but what you could do is you could build, say, 12 or 24 active missile canisters and then have the rest be empty canisters. Um, and when you, you would drop the canisters into the silo and the imagery analyst would not be able to tell um, which canisters are actually active. And so you wouldn't know which silos to target. So what you could do is you could turn your... 12 or 24 missiles into 120 targets for relatively cheap. Um, and this would mean that the United States would need to dedicate a large number of missiles to eliminate a relatively small force. Yeah. And it's worth saying that 
this is actually something the U.S. looked really seriously at doing in the 1980s, although uh, like everything in America, we were going to do it big. So the U.S. called this the shell game, and we were going to put 200 missiles and we're going to hide them among 4,600 shelters, uh, which was, of course, going to consume like massive amounts of the American West. And uh, uh, Reagan voting ranchers did not like this plan. So ultimately, they just stuck the MX when it became the peacekeeper in, in Minuteman silos. But, you know, China doesn't have like pesky government hating ranchers. Uh, and so it's when I I think one thing that really stood out to me was unlike previous Chinese deployments where the silos were spaced really far apart and each silo was alone, these are all clustered together. And it's not the only reason you'd cluster them together, but a good reason to stick them all together is if you're plan on shuttling canisters from silo to silo. The other striking thing about this for me is the fact that we can have this debate now in the public um, in what was previously only the domain of, of governments. And so, you know, Jeffrey... To that end, what response have you seen since this announcement? Well, it's been a really interesting set of responses. You know, the official U.S. government response has been pretty muted. But, you know, normally when you foul one up, they pour cold water on you. And what I take the Biden administration's response to be is to say, yeah, that's really interesting. And it's really curious as to what they're doing. And like, we should talk to them about that, which I think is good, right? Because I, I mean, if you have a podcast called Arms Control Wonk, you, 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 you want to do the arms control thing. Uh, but, you know, the other piece, and, and Decker and I have been trading memes back and forth about this, is um, uh, uh, Chinese netizens are, uh, are less happy with us. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting place to be stuck between the large number of very vocal people who think that I found a wind farm. And a large number of very vocal people who think that I have found, you know, 120 times three to five Merv warheads. I have found 500 warheads, um, something like that. Yeah, it is a really fascinating experience in the modern information ecosystem where, you know, Decker's very careful research immediately gets transformed into this. Uh, I refuse to believe it because I don't like it. Or uh, it's 100% true because I don't trust those Chinese. And like, there's now this huge debate of these people screaming at one another uh, who are completely disconnected from the, the underlying research, which on the one hand, it's, it's progress that we can do this stuff on the open source. But uh, boy, on the other hand, Twitter, that's a, that's a bad website. One of the more interesting responses that I've gotten, or well, at least I've, I've heard and read about from a couple of Chinese experts who I don't believe are arguing in bad faith, is the skepticism of my discovery because China wouldn't build 120 silos because the concept of a silo is obsolete. And this is interesting because it, it, it says something about when you've been looking at the PLARF invest over the past you know, decade and a half now, in more mobile forces and going through amazing logistical hurdles and, and committing to these massive logistical hurdles about, they don't even base the, the launchers, the warheads, and the rockets in the same place, right? All of that needs to be assembled during deployment. And so they had built this massive infrastructure project around making sure that happens. They dedicate all these resources to it to a fairly low number of missiles. I mean, the, the emphasis has been for the past decade and a half that the survivability through mobility and dispersion are much more important than sheer numbers. And so this, from that viewpoint of looking at the, this decade and a half of work, this looks like, this could look like a step backwards, right? This could look like a step backwards in which you are intentionally making your force more vulnerable. And, you know, my argument about that is that by making portions of your force more vulnerable, you're making other portions of your force more survivable through making sure that your adversary commits, you know, 240 warheads to destroying these targets. Yeah, that's 240 warheads that the U.S. would be allocating against that silo field that we couldn't use to barrage mobile missiles. Um, and so if those silos are largely empty... Um, that actually strikes me as, you know, a pretty clever solution to the problem of how do you deal with an adversary that just is, you know, building a lot more nuclear weapons than you have. 
Not that I want to revive the shell game for the United States. God, no, please. So there are a lot of steps between where we're at now and full out nuclear war. How should the United States be responding to this news? I think that we are in a situation where we spend the last 30 years trading on the unipolarity of the post-Cold War period, where we were powerful, we were safe, nobody was a threat to us. And so we could more or less set the arms control agenda we wanted, which was all reducing offensive forces while in no way, shape or form limiting defenses which we like got away with because Yeltsin was going to go along with it. And at least for the first few years, the after Bush withdrew from the ABM treaty, the Russians and the Chinese seemed pretty, pretty much in a wait and see mode. Now I think we are in a situation where both Russia and China are changing their forces. And if we don't like what they're doing, whether that's Russia with this bizarre science fiction weapons or China digging 120 silos, we're going to have to talk to them. And, you know, I, I'm a broken record on this, but honestly, talking to them and engaging in arms control means we have to put missile defense on the agenda. And it's a thing we don't like, and I get it. And maybe it's too hard, right? Maybe this is like school shootings. We know what we need to do, and we just don't have the will to do it. Um, but it seems pretty obvious to me that if you don't like what the Chinese are doing in the desert, you really have this one other option. Yeah, so, so digging a little deeper into that, it, it's not just the fact that missile defense is being pursued by the United States. It's that over the past 20 years, we have tried to assure the Russian and the Chinese that our missile defense systems will stay limited to only a force structure that would be able to be committed towards a possible North Korean attack or possibly a um, Iranian attack, right? And this attempt at assurance has basically completely failed. Um, because every time we say it's going to stay limited, we're not going to pursue these additional capabilities, we end up testing that capability like two or three years later, right? You know, we spent a decade assuring um, the Russians that the standard missile would not be capable of intercepting ICBMs. And now we are testing the standard missile against ICBM class targets. So, you know, I don't think that the Russian, the Chinese trust the United States to not, once we have gotten that capability, to scale it up rather dramatically in an attempt to negate Russian and Chinese offensive capabilities. I'm not sure I trust us not to do that. So, Jeffrey, this leads to my next question. You've said what we should do. Does Biden have the people? or the political will to go do it? I don't know. I guess we'll see. Uh, I am cautiously optimistic. Just to start with the president, I went to an arms control association meeting like 15 years ago where uh, Daryl Kimball had invited then Senator Joe Biden to address the, the, the little group. And Biden got off on this tangent about the Joint Data Exchange Center with Russia. I don't know if you remember JDAC, but like this is like the most obscure topic on earth. And Biden was like just going off about, uh, I'll never forget, he said, we have to get off the dime, which is, you know, like a reference to when phone calls cost a dime. Uh, but he, he himself personally knew about it, cared about it, and like got worked up about it. So I think, you know, on substance, Biden's in a great place. Um, and then the, just the question is, you know, what are the people around him going to be like? Uh, you know, I, when I look at the undersecretary level and see Colin Call and uh, Bonnie Jenkins, if she's confirmed, I mean, these are, these are incredible people. But it, it really does seem that you have a, a cadre of really smart, experienced people who get the nuclear threat. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I am hopeful. Uh, I don't think it's going to be easy. Um, you know, politics are politics. But at the end of the day, um, I, I think this is probably the best chance we've had in my professional career. Yeah, I think the core of the problem is the fact that um, the Missile Defense Agency 
has had 20 years to embed itself um, within the Department of Defense. They have a large number of supporters within the Air Force, within Congress. Um, and, you know, dislodging embedded institutions in, in the defense sector in the United States has proven to be a very difficult task in the past. Um, and so, you know, the, the question is whether or not the Biden administration can tackle the um, institutional momentum that the MDA has built up over the past you know, 20 years. So for those who want to learn more, the latest episode of Arms Control Wonk has a great deep dive on the subject. Jeffrey, where can listeners go to find the episodes? You can get the Arms Control Wonk podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, the whole deal. You can also get it from the website, armscontrolwonk.com. Decker, Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining. That was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me and having the podcast. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Derek Sender, Alex Hall, and Delphine Vigil, with research and assistance from Doreen Horshig and Harry Tarpey. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.